What does your blood sugar do to your brain? How do high blood sugar levels influence how you think? What does this have to do with carbs, glucose, continuous glucose monitors, diabetes, depression, and dementia? If you're interested in any of these things, you're going to love this conversation. I'm Dr. Austin Perlmutter. I'm a board certified internal medicine physician, and I'm focused on giving you practical tools and information to improve your brain health. If you're interested in how to improve your brain today and protect your brain health tomorrow, please subscribe. And if you want more of this specific type of content, stay tuned. I'll be doing a deep and comprehensive dive into this topic in future episodes. Disclaimer, this is for information purposes only. This is not health advice. To think, act, and feel in any way, your brain requires access to large amounts of consistent energy. And for most of us and most of the time, that energy is in the form of blood sugar or glucose, which is transported into your brain and used by your brain cells. While it's very well known that high levels of blood sugar and very low levels of blood sugar can have acute and significant negative effects on your brain function, Research is now indicating that long-term blood sugar issues may play a significant role in our mental and especially our cognitive state. In this conversation, we're going to be exploring how blood sugar, again, glucose, influences brain health and practical strategies that speak to this science. Now, your brain is only a few pounds in weight, but it uses 20 to 25% of your body's blood sugar. That's actually double what is used by a chimpanzee. Interesting little fact. The brain can also use other forms of fuel, and you may have heard of some of this. The most popular alternate source of fuel that people are talking about is ketone bodies. But interestingly, the brain can also run on lactate, and lactate has historically been seen as a byproduct of exercise and is elevated in certain disease states, but we're now understanding that the brain can use lactate as a fuel. For most people, however, ketones and lactate do not make up a significant contribution at rest in terms of total brain energy relative to the contribution from blood sugar. Again, circulating glucose in our bloodstream. Our blood sugar levels go up and down during the day, and blood sugar typically goes up after a meal, and then it goes to a relatively lower level after longer periods when we don't eat. Blood sugar levels are more typically in the United States measured in milligrams per deciliter of blood, and blood sugar levels when measured in a clinical setting tend to be after fasting. A usual range for a, flat, a fasting blood sugar is between 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. When blood sugar levels are very high, for example, over 300 milligrams per deciliter or very low, for example, less than 55 milligrams per deciliter, there are much higher chances for having acute alterations in mental status and brain state. And in the very extreme cases, people can even go into a comatose state because of these alterations in blood sugar. A rapid development of a very high or a very low blood sugar and the resultant changes in our brain state are far more likely to occur in people with diabetes, although there are other causes of very high and very low blood sugar. But we're also learning that long-term, more subtle changes in our blood sugar can have a significant effect on our brain health and on our brain state. For example, simply having type 2 diabetes, which currently is uh, affecting 1 in 10 Americans, can translate into an over 50% increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease and a doubling of the risk of being diagnosed with a mental health condition. I'll say that again, having type two diabetes, which influences and affects about one in 10 Americans may translate into a 50% increased risk for Alzheimer's and a doubling of risk for having a mental health condition. But to add to that conversation, we now understand that pre-diabetes, which influences and impacts about 40% of Americans and 50% of Americans after age 65 can also significantly increase our chances of getting any type of dementia. And in an interesting recent 2024 meta-analysis, having prediabetes was linked to an increased risk for depression, especially in younger people. Very important point here is that over 80% of people with prediabetes don't know they have prediabetes. So what we're talking about here are millions of people in the United States who are basically having negative potential brain effects from a condition that they don't know about.
So how do blood sugar levels actually influence brain health? There are a number of pathways that link alterations in our blood sugar levels, again, our circulating glucose to brain health issues. But we need to start at a very basic level with understanding that our brain's constant need for regular access to glucose is key to brain health. And anything that compromises the flow of glucose to the brain can lead to brain health issues. So hypoglycemia, which is a very low blood sugar level, can lead to a lack of energy to power our neurons. In animal data, hypoglycemia is shown to impair neurotransmitter signaling. And we also know that there are pathways, including the generation of oxidative stress and damage to mitochondria that may be a consequence of having low blood sugar. On the opposite end of the spectrum, high blood sugar, also called hyperglycemia, is linked to brain dysfunction through a number of pathways. For example, elevated glucose levels may actually cause toxicity. We also know that issues with insulin signaling, which tends to accompany the state of diabetes, could be damaging to the brain. High blood sugar levels may also lead to brain cell growth suppression and even death of brain cells in the hippocampus. The hippocampus here, very important because it is key to long-term memory. Other pathways associated with high blood sugar include elevations in inflammation, damage to our vascular system, impairments in or damage to the blood-brain barrier, damage to or issues with our mitochondria, increased oxidative stress, as well as issues with synapses, which are the spaces, the connections between our neurons. In addition to these direct effects of either high or low blood sugar on brain, we also know that too much variability in blood sugar may act on many of these same pathways, including increasing inflammation and elevating oxidative stress. This means that as we look at the risk posed by changes in our blood sugar levels, it may not all be about having too high of a blood sugar or too low of a blood sugar, but even how quickly our blood sugar levels go up and down. So how do these pathways that are influenced by blood sugar influence our cognitive state and our mental health? Of the many mechanisms tethering blood sugar issues to brain cells, almost all are believed to contribute to brain health issues like rapid brain aging, dementia and depression, as well as even conditions like impulsive behavior and violent behavior. That is very interesting because what we're saying here is that all the pathways that could be acted on by alterations in blood sugar at unhealthy levels or more rapid variability than what is healthy could actually translate into a host of different brain states. The implications are pretty profound. If alterations in healthy brain energy are being driven by a growing epidemic of blood sugar dysfunction, and this activates unhealthy pathways linked to all these brain diseases, then we need to see that improving blood sugar balance should be a top priority as a population. So what steps can we take when we incorporate all this information, when we understand that we really don't want very high blood sugar levels, very low blood sugar levels, and maybe even that we need to pay attention to blood sugar variability. And certainly what we want to do is to help take steps to decrease our chances of developing overt metabolic dysfunction, as in the case of type 2 diabetes. What can we do about this? I'm going to get into this, but if you haven't already subscribed to this channel, please do so. It's incredibly helpful for me so I can create more engaging content for you. When it comes to blood sugar issues, it's important to note there is a need for different approaches depending on an individual's biology, their diagnoses, and their unique life circumstances. For example, some people have diseases that require prescription medications or medical supervision. And so in these people, there is a lot more need to take caution, to be cautious before making overt changes. With this said, I think it's very key to understand that we've moved away from an issue in which overt blood sugar problems are rare. And increasingly, we find ourselves in a time where almost everybody benefits from taking a closer look at their blood sugar regulation and the risk that that regulation may pose to brain health. So some of the best tools available at this time, and I'm recording this at the start of 2025, include the following. Number one, get curious about and learn about your own biology. As I mentioned before, when we have 40% of Americans with prediabetes and 80% of those people who don't know they have it, 
Most people with blood sugar issues don't know they have blood sugar issues. So what do you do to gain some insight into how your blood sugar is functioning? Well, one way is just to get your routine labs. So there are a number of different labs that you can get in a, uh, your typical doctor's visit, including a fasting blood sugar and a hemoglobin A1C, or a, uh, hemoglobin A1C is a, a popular metric for blood sugar over multiple months. You should also consider looking for labs like a fasting insulin level. This can give insight into risk for diabetes. Beyond this, I am a fan of using a continuous glucose monitor or a CGM at least once to give you some insight into what is happening in real time with your blood sugar. Even though this is not exactly the same as getting a blood sugar measurement because of the way that it measures the interstitial fluid between your cells, it can be a very important first step to getting insights into how your physiology works, and it is a powerful biofeedback tool. Tip number two would be to eat a balanced diet rich in fiber, phytochemicals, protein, and healthy fat, low in added sugars, and low in refined carbohydrates. There are many different diets and many different people talking about why you should be eating this, that, or something else, and something else. But the best study diets for brain health are the Mediterranean diet and its variant, the mind diet. The combinations of nutrients in these diets, these are specifically minimally processed food diets, uh, are known to be helpful for brain-related and blood sugar-related pathways. It's also notable that these diets have been studied to be protective against blood sugar issues like the development of diabetes. Tip number three is going to be to prioritize regular exercise and don't skip on weight training. Exercise is well known to benefit the brain. It's also well known to be influencing in a positive way blood sugar regulation. And while aerobic exercise is important, aerobic exercise, something like jogging, a number of recent publications have shown that weight training, especially weight training for large muscle groups like your legs, can be especially beneficial for blood sugar management because when we exercise our skeletal muscle, it actually pulls glucose out of our bloodstream and into the muscle. Tip number four is going to be work on mitigating chronic stress. While there are a number of pathways that may be involved linking stress with blood sugar regulation, the general idea here is that chronic stress damages healthy blood sugar control and it impairs healthy brain function. For example, in diabetics, when people had more work stress, it predicted higher blood sugar levels. You can't necessarily remove, nor should you want to remove all the stress in your life. But things you can do to help mitigate stress would be things like uh, practicing mindfulness, spending time in nature, practicing breath work, uh, as well as for those who need the additional help, seeking professional help through psychotherapy or other professional help, which can be great in conjunction with some of these other resources and may actually be the most beneficial for those who have significant psychological stress. Next tip is going to be to work to get seven to eight hours of high quality sleep a night. Why is that so important? Well, first of all, getting good sleep is the most undervalued resource we have available. It's readily available, it's free, and it's incredibly effective at boosting our brain health and helping to regulate a number of systems within our body. Research suggests that getting too many or too few hours of sleep a night puts people at a higher risk for developing type 2 diabetes, and alterations in sleep patterns are linked to higher risk for dementia. Now, why would people who get more than the eight hours of sleep a night, let's say nine plus hours, get uh, higher risk for conditions? There are a number of possibilities here, but one is that these are people who are struggling with things like obstructive sleep apnea and may actually not be getting quality sleep, and therefore, despite the fact that they're in bed for nine hours, they're not actually getting restorative sleep. So this is an indication here that if you're struggling with a lot of sleep, you may actually benefit from getting a sleep analysis or a sleep study. There's also some interesting tools, some tech that can give you insights into whether you're getting good quality sleep. So with all of this said, what we've covered here are some of the major pathways linking alterations in blood sugar, again, circulating glucose with brain health states. And I think what we've done is highlighted why it is so important to care about blood sugar regulation if you care about brain health. Then we've talked about some of the practical tools and tips that have been studied to be beneficial in regulating pathways, connecting blood sugar levels with brain state. If you're interested in this content, again, please subscribe. It's incredibly helpful to this channel. And otherwise, I will look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thanks for listening, watching, and caring about your brain. I'm Dr. Austin Promoter, and I'll see you later.